Well, ladies and gentlemen, years ago on the campus of Syracuse University, there set a stadium. And the stadium was called Archbold Stadium. Stadium that was named after John D. Archbold, the person who brought oil and gas to America, man. John Dustin Archbold was the head of the Board of Trustees and he had quite a bit to do with picking the next chancellor after Chancellor Sims retired. Uh, Mr. Archibald was from New York City and he knew a minister there, the Reverend James Roscoe Day, and he sort of handpicked Mr. Day to come and be the chancellor. And Mr. Day was someone who was very gung-ho about sports. Um, it was considered part of the regular curriculum. And the idea of having a stadium was a, uh, something that he, after he'd been here for a while, decided it was really something they needed. You've got to realize just how few buildings, for instance, there were on the campus when Mr. Day came on board. Now, Chancellor Day became chancellor in 1894. By the time he left in 1922, there were about 24, 25 more buildings on campus. And a lot of those not necessarily were the gifts of Mr. Archbold, but certainly as a member of the Board of Trustees and his generosity being emulated by the rest of the Board of Trustees. You had buildings being built, um, Lyman Hall, Smith Hall, um, the old row, as they call it, that faces College uh, Place. Those went up, and then in the back, you had the lovely gymnasium, and then you had Carnegie Library, and you had the Bowne Hall of Chemistry. All of those were built at approximately the same time. So at the turn of the 20th century, you had an immense amount of building. Mr. Archibald was very generous. If there was a shortfall in the university's finances, he was always very happy to write a check at the end of the year so that there wouldn't be any red ink in the books. The oval, this is where the quad is now. And Mr. Archibald paid to have it graded so that they had a nice smooth surface to play games and there were stands that the fans could use. But as the university grew, Pretty soon the oval just wasn't enough. And so Mr. Archbold had the stadium built for Syracuse University and also the Archbold Gymnasium as well. John D. Archbold, oil, standard oil, oil money. And at that time was one of the biggest gifts ever given to a university or college for athletic facilities when he gave the money for the development and the building of Archbold Stadium. It was considered when they built Archibald Stadium, the largest open concrete stadium in the world, and it was compared favorably to the old Roman Colosseum. There was a canopy over the top of the south side. It looked, had that feeling of Rome, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the Colosseums that you find in Rome. The same kind of design was on board. And I looked and said, oh my God, Archibald, here it is. One end of it was the entrance was almost like going into a fortress and they had two towers and they had long steps leading up to it from Irving Ave and I, th I think it was good for a touchdown just to see the stadium for opponents. And out of that football stadium some of the greatest games ever were played as Syracuse University developed a great fantastic outstanding football program. And of course Archibald yes it was an old stadium uh, you could see it was, it was a combination of concrete and wood. And the wood was really the extension, the extra seats that they had added to the stadium. And the bleachers, believe it or not, went from where the cement portion of the stadium ended down to the field itself. And that created 16,000 additional seats. Also, I discovered that in the early days of Archbowl, uh, female students and male students didn't sit together. They were segregated in, in Archbowl. The fans were split gender-wise. Ladies on one side of the stadium, guys on the other. You did not have, for the most part, mixed seating until after World War II when you had the GI Bill in place and a lot of the uh, soldiers who came to use the GI Bill were married. So their wives came with them and the wives 
were not going to sit on the opposite side. They put up lights, but the poles went through the press box. And so you had a double pole, and this, these were the front row of the press row. And it was one of those things that people would come in here the first time and kind of look in amazement. The press would think back on the food that was served in the press box at Archbold. Uh, it was a man, Min Christensen was his name. He was just a great SU fan. He did catering service and he did the catering and it was basically sandwiches and soup. But his soup, clam chowder, was infamous. And years later, I'd run into people and they say, hey, do you still serve that clam chowder in the press box? It was just one of those things that, part of what makes tradition. I thought for the farewell that we should have uh, probably some champagne. So I bought a case of champagne and after the final game, offered champagne to any of the media that wanted it and there were one or two bottles left and there was one bottle of champagne from the 1978 final game that's in the trophy case out in the football wing at Manly. So anybody out there someday should walk by and look around and they'll find that one bottle of champagne still there. Great vintage or else a total vinegar by now. But you still have people who will always be nostalgic for Archibald because that was their, their time, their, uh, their building. So toss in the telephone poles through the press box, the clam chowder and the visiting locker room. And you've got three aspects of SU football back in the days of Archibald Stadium.